saints And I'm so in love with you For what you've done for me Here I am to worship you Without any restraint You're the only way The truth and life That makes me You're listening to Spiritual Encounters with Pastor Casper McLeod. And now, here's your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters, and I am your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper, along with my dear friend, co-host, Shane Breaker, Pastor Brandon Gallops, and our producer, Barry Richard. You know, the, the way we can function today in the world simply by learning to practice doing what the Lord says, being a doer of the word, not a hearer only, so you don't deceive yourself controlling your thought life because God's not going to control your thought life. The Lord is in control. We know he controls everything, but he's not going to control your thought life. That's your job. So when you get thoughts that are poisonous and we all get, you know, bombarded with this stuff, just walking through every day, Long term, you're probably going to develop some kind of disease and addictions come through there. And research surely closed that um, you know, thoughts are directly linked in your body through the mind, um, the body spirit soul connection involving all the different nerves, chemical pathways um, through the hypothalamus gland. And we'll be talking about that at this conference again. Keeping in mind that your hypothalamus gland acts like the brain of the endocrine system, so it can only respond to what you're actually thinking what you believe. It's huge. So when you meditate on the Word of God, healing is going to happen because that's what God tells us. So again, I'll tell you, if, if 98% of all sicknesses and diseases and addictions are the result of what goes on in your thought life, then hallelujah, 98% of sicknesses, diseases, and addictions can be cured by putting on the mind of Christ and seeing it from the heavenly perspective. Amen. Pastor Brandon, yeah. how are you doing tonight? Man, I'm doing great, Pastor Casper. Looking forward to this weekend with you in Holly Springs. And uh, I'll just throw out there, I'm going to have some men with me that will be sharing some testimonies uh, of their healing and deliverance and recovery from uh, from chemical addiction. Uh, some men that uh, have come through our program here at Redeem Ministries and, and are now, uh, well, one of them actually works for the ministry and just, uh, you know, have amazing testimonies of restoration and healing in their life uh, and how God has just absolutely transformed them into a new creation, which is exactly what his word says he will do. Hallelujah. It sounds like the gathering demoniac, somebody that was, you know, came to your program and and, and the Lord said, no, you, you're not following me out of the city. You stay here and tell them about me. Yeah, absolutely, brother. Absolutely. So that's that's the opportunity the Lord has given us this weekend. And I look forward to sharing that time with you, brother, as always. So we got a, a wonderful guest, our friend Ali Dutton is back, and then we're going to talk about crazy stuff, Iran, <laughs> UFOs. I mean, he's a UFO, you know, expert in the whole Nephilim thing that's unfolding here. Ali, welcome back to Spiritual Encounters. What's going on in your world today? Thank you for having me, Pastor. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and, and share what the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, uh, wonderful! It's a beautiful sunny day here, and and the days are longer, and it's always nice, you know, when you come out at eight o'clock at night and it's still sunlight outside because in Toronto, you know, it can get uh, dark early. So it's a it's been a wonderful sunny day today, and uh, life is great. So last time we were together, I, I, Pastor Brandon was away doing a mission trip, but we talked about what was happening in Iran, and I, I just come back from the UK. And people were asking me, like, well, how come the, the churches are folding and closing there? And I remember saying in an interview, several interviews, that's because, you know, that's what happens when you teach religion over so many years, instead of sharing the gospel. So what, what is going on? Because I, the Iranian church is now the fastest growing church in the entire world. Who would imagine something like that unfolding? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, uh, It's unexpected. Uh, 
uh, I, I remember years ago, I, I bought this Lonely Planet guide to traveling in Iran. And I opened it up and it said, the golden rule of traveling in Iran is expect the unexpected. Well, this kind of fits into that. Um, God, uh, is, God's spirit really is a mysterious spirit that travels through the nations and carries out the will of the Lord. So it seems that at this time in history, God had uh, thought of a end times uh, harvest from the Persian people at the revolution in 1979 when religion came to the forefront. Uh, I would say that you know there was a group of the population that was very religious, but a lot of the large portion of the population was just or secular or kind of culturally religious, meaning that they just lived under a cultural umbrella. But the coming of an Islamic government forced people, I think, to look into religion and look into, you know, these revealed texts and ask themselves questions about what they actually believed in. And there was this massive dispersion where Iranians were uh, catapulted to all the four winds of the earth and they came into contact with other thought. And one of the thoughts that they came into contact with was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a massive revival suddenly among the diaspora. And as people shared with their friends and family back home, it was like a torch that lit a fire. Uh, the entire country just uh, came alive. Uh, I was there in last July, and there are people selling Bibles right in the street uh, in, in plain sight. And and the reason for that is because it's such a... Uh, I asked one of those booksellers, why are you doing this? Are you a believer? He said, no, but it's really great for business. The demand mm -hmm. is so high. And so the uh, apparently there's a revival in the whole of the Muslim world right now, uh, but it's you know forbidden to talk about it openly, so you don't hear much about it in the news. And it is led by the uh, Iranian church, meaning that there, uh, in, in the entire Muslim world, uh, it is among the Iranians that most pe more people are coming to faith than than any other uh, of the Islamic nations. And people who have come to faith from this Iranian. Uh, uh, from Iran uh, have have been led to a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 49 um, that talks about such a restoration. It's, uh, uh, it starts um, in verse 35 and goes till uh, the end of the chapter 49. So verse 35 to verse 39 in the book of Jeremiah. And I think we, we talked about that a little bit and, and it's, it's very interesting. Yet there is another side to uh, the, uh, the story of Iran at this time in history, and that is perhaps um, the, uh, the story of judgment, that, that there are both things happening. And even that passage in Jeremiah is, it, uh, is pregnant with both of those messages, revival and judgment. Both things are spoken uh, about Iran at this time in history. Yeah, yeah. And, and isn't that interesting because isn't that kind of what we see the theme throughout scripture that will kind of play out around the world in the last days that we will see places where you will have great revival and you will see places where you will have a great falling away and we are absolutely i believe experiencing that uh of course in iran as you're talking about uh but just around the world in general right now yes absolutely uh, i think that uh, for me, at least, um, the, the regathering of Israel uh, to the Middle East was a great sign uh, upon which uh, hinges the fulfillment of many of the prophecies of the Bible leading to the second coming of the Lord. Who would have thought that the Islamic world, strong uh, as it is, would suddenly be parted open and, and a Hebrew nation plopped light right in the middle of it? Uh, it took two world wars uh, to make it happen. Uh, the first one, the first world war, you know, brought that piece of land out, out of the hands of the Ottomans. And the second world war uh, ended up creating circumstances that led to the creation of that state. And, and so I think that all that we're seeing happen in the Middle East, including the rise of uh, uh, political Islam and, and, and the Islamic revolution of Iran, are somehow tied to this season of history that was ushered in by the beginnings of the regathering of, of the Hebrew people to a land uh, that God had set aside for his purposes. Yeah. It, it's interesting also, um, Ali, because the, you know, there's, you touched on it, but there's other prophecies obviously that concern Iran in the last days. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, and 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 look, just so p- people may not know, uh, you are Persian by birth. Am I? Yes, is that correct? True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. So very qualified to speak on this subject, uh, and <laughs> yeah. and and familiar with the interworkings of of Iran and and the culture and 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 how things go there. Um, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I just touched on this in Sunday school at our church uh, just in the last couple of weeks. The Ezekiel thirty eight prophecy. Um, yes. Where, of course, Iran is called by Persia, which a lot of people don't realize that the nation of Iran was called Persia until the 1930s. Yeah, yeah, until 1935. What happened was the king, so the last king of Iran, um, Mohammad Reza uh, Pahlavi, his father, um, he uh, was was uh, came to power at a time where there are all these strong um, leaders, such as the Ataturk, who came to power in Turkey, Franco in Spain, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in uh, Germany, and Reza Shah was his name in Iran. And uh, he thought, okay, you know, Persia has always been a very important country for 2500, excuse me, for 2,500 years. But now, because of the rise of the industrial age, it has fallen uh, behind. So Iran must catch up by uh, industrializing. So he brought the railroad to Iran, the telegraph system. He created last names, issued passports and birth certificates, started to modernize the country. And as part of this effort of modernizing, he said, you know what, let's let go of the ancient name because it holds us back. It ties us to the past. We need a new name. It's a kind of rebranding for the modern era. And so he chose the name Iran. And the reason for that is because um, there was this idea that was brought by some uh, in- English thinkers that there was a race called the Aryans. And they came from you know, the heartland of Europe, from Germany. Uh, and they conquered the, the, the people who live in, in India. And they created kind of you know, uh, a, a new world in India. And the Iranians saw themselves as the descendants of the Aryans in the thinking of this king. And so he took the name Iran because it was, uh, uh, you know, it tied into, into this idea of Aryan. That's, that's where the name is com- comes from. There's a Nephilim connection there as well. Maybe you want to explore that with us. Uh, what, in the sense of uh, the Aryans? I mean, yeah, with the Aryan race and that whole, right. when you get down to the root issue there. And, and uh, Greek mythology and, and the Nephilim. That's yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. That's, that's it's clear <clears throat> yeah. that that the seed of the sons of God, you know, definitely had a connection that was planted, you know, in that world, which eventually flowered uh, with the Nazi movement, so the occult connection that they had, and this idea that they're going to become a race that would, you know, replace the race of uh, that God had chosen, the chosen people that God had chosen, uh, they would replace uh, uh, that race. They would have their worship of of, of the spiritual forces, the dark demonic forces that inspired, you know, technology and all kinds of uh, strategies in their minds. And this leader, this guide, the Fuhrer, that would lead them. And so this was definitely um, connected to the seed of the serpent and the sons of God. And it was defeated, uh, you know, uh, at the end of World War II. But perhaps it was a sign, a type of things that are ahead of us um, coming. Um, now, in the case of the king of Iran, I think it was more um, just just an idea that was floating in the air that, you know what, that we're trying to modernize. Hey, actually, our roots are from this more modern world. Um, now, the, the, the king even you know, the, reached out to Hitler saying, hey, you know, you guys are Aryans and we're Aryans. We should all work together. Um, and uh, after uh, World War II, um, the British and the French, you know, punished him <clears throat> for having made that, uh, uh, for reaching out to Hitler. And so they asked that he abdicate and, and uh, enter into house arrest. And his son was made the king. And that was the king that was in power when the revolution happened in 1979. Okay, um, let me just interject for a moment, um, just to set the stage here, because... From all appearances, Hitler was another stooge that was placed into power. Behind that, you've got the elite bankers like the Warburg brothers that financed both sides of the war. So you've got a group of people that are making tremendous fortunes on on wars, world wars. 
the, yeah. the, the orchestrating these things behind the scene. Of course, behind that layer, we, we know the, the devil's behind all of it at, at that point, trying to you know cause as much havoc at, at, at all. And we've got the thought police in hard work, like on social media now. You're basically looking at an Orwellian society that's unfolded from a result of all these things. Um, again, you know, ignorance. Um, so the word of God is, is the result of this thing. Yes, absolutely. The, the word of God is guiding the light because we're born, each generation, uh, we're born into history. We have a very short lifespan. Our culture tells us what we should think. We don't really know how history got to where it got, and it gives a lot of room for uh, dark forces to reinvent history uh, yes. for us. And so the word of God gives us that, you know, bird's eye perspective and uh, tells us where we came from, how we got here, where we're going, why we are here, and, and meditating on it, studying it, hearing it. It's very important. It really is a light uh, the, that opens our minds to, to what's going on and provides lots of answers. I think that everyone is thirsty for it. I mean, people want to know the meaning of life. There really is an emptiness in every man that can only be filled by God himself. And I think that that's why God has put that emptiness in us. So that when we look for various desires to fulfill it and we don't, then finally we come to him and he fulfills it for us. And one of those things that I think we crave is the meaning of life. And that is where the word of God, uh, at least the cosmic tale that it tells, provides a lot of answers to the question of the meaning of life, the purpose of life, our identity, the story in which we find ourselves and where we are headed. And that gives lots of hope and meaning uh, to life once you realize, well, this is actually true. All the pieces add up. The archaeology is there. The prophecies add up. Um, and, of course, uh, through the cross, we do have a connection with the Lord that is very tangible and real. And through the Holy Spirit, we come to uh, experience the presence of God. Our prayers are heard and answered, um, and, and the Lord talks to us. And so he becomes very real, and it requires some meditation on the Word. And I, and I hope that shows like this are here to share with people uh, the fruits of you know what we have found as the Lord has led us uh, into research. Again, we are looking at a time where we've got to manage the gender as well. And, and so, I mean, unless people, you know, the Lord says, you know, seek, knock, and, and it'll be answered unto you, right? Yeah. We've got a lot of places that are offering uh, line signs and wonders. And we've got uh, modern churches that are doing all sorts of witchcraft today that's been infiltrated, right? Because the enemy is like, he's, he's run out of time. So we got the Sagillian dialectic, which is trying to manipulate us into particular patterns of thoughts and actions. And we got um, people are not aware of the artificial intelligence at this point that, that's controlling so much of things. And, and, and just in communications alone, you know, we say things that you know they don't want. Immediately they're going to try to censor things. It's going to probably intensify in the next several months. I think we think about it. We observe that. You've got plans of, um, of the future, right? You got people having secret meetings um, behind highly secured doors who influence the economies, who influence controlling energy resources, the weather manipulation, like with ARP, um, artificial yeah. technology that are, you know, I mean, these things are unfolding at a rapid rate. You got Elon Musk wanting to put a microchip in everybody's brain, you know, by mixing yes. it, starting doing Neural this. Thing. I mean, so I mean, we think about all this is going on, this whole new world order that the Bible talks about. Yes. We're watching this thing unfold. So you got all these these people, you know, behind closed doors making these, you know, decisions that nobody else is allowed to be in on. The acceleration of the advent of technology uh, and social change is plunging us into a world that is unrecognizable to previous generations. And I think that above all, it is this generation that needs the light of the Word of God because the times we're being plunged in are so confusing, so full of deception, so altered and so powerful with the kinds of toys that are being offered to us that without you know, this connection to, uh, uh, to God and to His Word, uh, it would be very difficult to not get be carried into uh, by the undertow, be carried into the wave of, of these changes because they're very powerful. I mean, uh, technology is um, like iPhones. You know, we all have it in our pockets. Next thing you know, uh, we start to have wearables. You wear glasses. You wear watches. 
then and the G5 and then the G5 comes yeah. 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 Well, and, and isn't it interesting that with the technologies and everything that you just talked about, you kept using the word, it's plunging us into that. It's also plunging us right into the depths of prophecy. Exactly. Because, because all of these technologies play right into the hands of biblical prophecies. Uh, that the, the biblical writers, um, John, uh, Ezekiel, Paul, those that were taken and shown the end times, Daniel, it's it's hard for us to understand. They use the language of their day exactly. to explain things from our day and beyond. Yes. So how would John or, or Daniel have explained the internet or spaceships or drones or uh, or an iPhone, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, or, or or a biometric scan of the eye, uh, you know, a retina scan of the eye, or a or a biometric reading of of a thumb, uh, or so on and so forth. They they use the language of their day, or else they would have been looked on even crazier than they already were. <laughs> and, I mean, it's just the truth. And so now here we are, two thousand years later, and we see things written in the language of 2000 years ago, describing things when you view it from that perspective in exacting detail that we're living in today. Yeah. Like for instance, I'm, I'm writing right now about the chariots of God uh, that are found throughout the scripture. Like it says in Isaiah chapter 66, that God will come with his chariots. Now the word in Hebrew is Merkeva or Rikab, depending on the passage, but it actually means vehicle. That's what it means in Hebrew. Um, and and, and it, it has connotations of cavalry, like God will come with his vehicles, God will come with his cavalry. And um, But until today, there was no other word for vehicle but chariot. So biblical translators felt, it was why would they call it vehicle? Because chariot was the only type of vehicle that existed, it would have been redundant. So they referred to it simply as chariot. But that led our minds down the road of, you know, the horse buggies. And also the painters of the Renaissance that kind of try to imagine how this all played out based on where they were in history. However, as you were saying, perhaps uh, the writers of the Bible, when they talk about chariots of fire and horses of fire, are trying to capture in the language of their day something that they don't quite fully have a word for. That's uh, right. And so they do that. And there's lots of examples of this, especially in biblical prophecy. Um, for instance, we were talking about chapter 38 in the scroll of Ezekiel, and it talks about all of this warfare, and it, it puts it in the language of horses and, and shields and swords. However, we know that today uh, we don't go to war using, you know, horses and shields and swords. Uh, we do have sh shields. They're just not, you know, pieces of metal. Um, they're complicated electronic uh, radar uh, missile systems, you know, that shield us, like the Iron Dome in Israel. For instance, uh, the Patriot system, all kinds of uh, systems of ground to air, you know, that shield us from incoming uh, arrows. You know, uh, what happens with the bows and arrows? Will they turn into missiles? Um, and uh, what happens to spears? Will they turn into missiles? Will the swords turn into bullets, uh, uh, small, tiny pieces of flying uh, metal. Um, you've got uh, horses. Well, horses turn into cavalry. So uh, uh, th that's why even to this day, the tanks and, and all that stuff is called the cavalry because that's what happened. It became mechanized. So we went from horses to mechanized cavalry. And so when the Bible is talking about that, I think that the Lord is um, understands that we're, we're smart enough uh, when he leads us to see that this has never happened on the stage of history, and it is about the future, and we are now living in a time uh, of modern uh, warfare, and so he, I think he, he he assumes that yes, we will understand that this cavalry is now mechanized, and that is what Ezekiel, um, you know, is essentially pointing to. Um, uh, it's it's clear uh, it's a form of communication uh, that God has created, and it's fascinating. Why has he done it? Um, because I think it's a time of uh, fake news. Uh, it's a time uh, of deception, which has always been the heart of strategy and warfare, is to change the nature of reality in the mind of the enemy. And in this case, we humans, we, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, we are the enemy. 
um, of, of this uh, very powerful and ambitious uh, being uh, who has taken one third of the angels with him in his great desire to become the first principle of the creation to be worshipped and who sees Adam as a great competition because the destiny of Adam is to judge the angels. And so he deceives us and he creates false reality for us. And that's why today, above all, uh, the word of God is needed to counter uh, this fake news because of television, because of the Internet, uh, where uh, news is, is broadcasted and the minds of billions of people is shaped. And so the word of God is here, I think, to, to, to say, no, well, make sure that you understand things uh, through this revelation, because I love you. I care for you. And I want you to know the truth. I want you to be safe. I want you to be guided. I want you to be blessed. And so I think that's why God has left his word for us uh, and these prophecies, especially for this day and age, because of the rising of darkness. There's also the rising of light. Absolutely. You, you know, Ali, I, I also, it's my opinion, but I believe that um, another reason for, obviously, the language was written in the language of their day but if, if you look at the prophetic scriptures, especially when we get into Revelation, what do we see so many times? Uh, yeah. This will take much discernment. The one who understands this. In other words, we're going to have to search for these things. We're going to have to do some digging. We're going to have to do some research. Uh, God wants us to be invested in his word and invested in the times that we live in. Uh, and I think that's another reason that, the, that especially the prophetic scriptures were written in the way that they were. Yeah, that's a very good point. The Lord says, those who seek me diligently will find me. And yes. so there is this feeling of, you know, uh, why would God murky the waters uh, by allowing lies and deception? Why would he just not let the truth, you know, shine forward? Because I think there's a testing of the hearts. I think we have a that's role right. to play in this tale of creation. We have a responsibility. We have free will. God has given us that. And, and so we are invited into the chambers of God. We are invited to love him with all our heart, mind, and soul. And, and there's a testing of the hearts and minds. And the juxtaposition of light and darkness, of lies and truth, uh, you know, uh, allows the hearts to be tested. Because then those who truly seek the Lord are thirsting for the true truth and want to know will carve through the lies and be, be led to the fountain of truth. If it was obvious then everyone uh, would naturally embrace it because out of the fear of death, I would say. Uh, but I think there's a testing of the hearts and minds, and the Lord is like, well, do you love me? Uh, if you do, then come forward. I'm here for you. But uh, if not, here's a temptation. Here's another perspective. Here's something that might suit you. Perhaps you, can, you, know, you might want to choose that. And there's a sifting uh, of the human race. You know, in our culture, because of the democracy and after the war, World War II, uh, there is kind of a flattening of the hierarchy. There's a, a lack of respect for elders. There's a lack of respect for wisdom, uh, for experience, and everything becomes flat. And with the advent of the search engine, Google, people just, you know, look for information. We have lost perhaps the fear and awe of God. Uh, we have forgotten that we are the creation of something else and that we have to be, uh, we have to humble ourselves and uh, understand that our life um, uh, is in the hands of God. And, and so, uh, yes, you know, we do have to seek him and find him and, uh, and love him. It's, it's for our benefit. And regardless, this is the reality we find ourselves in because we are the creation of something else. You know, we're, we're not completely lords uh, of our own life we don't even know where the earth is we don't know where the universe is uh we just pop out here and and the adventure begins we know very little and so we do really have to have the humility to rely on the lord and seek him with our hearts and minds uh, and i think he rewards that as you're saying it does indeed he tells us it's the honor the kings and priests of sir charles and Arthur. he wants us to, to diligently be seeking him um, going back to Daniel, I mean, kind of considering all things that you're talking about here with Iran and the whole UFO connection, um, in Daniel we read this um, amazing scripture, uh, it's Daniel um, ten. chapter 2, back to oh, chapter ten. 2, he yeah. says, where um, I saw iron mixed with miry clay and they mingled themselves with the seed of man. Yes. And, and, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Wh who's they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man? I mean, 
We're not told directly who they are here. However, I believe the Lord's showing us the answer. And we look at this um, the sentence uh, grammatically. Obviously, where it says they indicates a different group of seed of man. So now this reality that you're talking about is being expanded in other di dimensions. So if all humanity would be the seed of men, then where we've been created with the seed of biological fathers, how do we resolve that verse? I mean, we've gone over these things in the past. So logically, um, you know, they mingle themselves with the seed of men. We're talking fallen angels here. We're talking Nephilim joins. I mean, what's going on with that from your perspective and all the research um, over the years? Something happened here. We can go back to the Genesis 6 floor. But I mean, how, how is this playing out, you see? Um, with Iran, and, and we've got true revivals happening. We've got the supernatural church happening. We've got the remnant church, and we've got the superficial church happening. We've got lying signs and wonders on one side, and we've got genuine you know, moves of God on the other. Um, all sorts of miraculous things happening. But, but uh, again, again, Casper, I would just say, isn't that exactly what the Word of God says would happen in the last days? If you go to does. Matthew 24... Jesus says, you know, that there will be false prophets in the last days who will perform many signs and wonders among you that would deceive even the very elect if that were possible. Then we can fast forward again to the book of Revelation and, and, and we can look at uh, just, for instance, the two witnesses that will be able to call down fire from heaven. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we're not I'm not going to get into a debate about who the two witnesses are, but the bottom line is some weird things are going to happen in the last days. And let's just face the facts. We're seeing some weird things happen in the last days. And we're having people drawn into things that just because it is supernatural, they automatically believe it is from God, forgetting that there are two sides to the supernatural equation. Yeah, the, the heart of the matter is we've forgotten who we are. I mean, what's happening on this planet is that here was planted those who were made in the image of God. From the very get-go, we were in a much larger story than just a human tale because we were of the kingdom of heaven. We were made in the image of God, and there were other beings involved in the story who existed before we were created. That's and right. They, they had a history with God. They had their own history. You know, when God calls uh, this, 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 the serpent, the shining one, the adversary, uh, we don't know exactly who, what, what his name is. We have lots of titles for him. Uh, when God calls him the ancient dragon, you know, this ancient serpent, well, you think, well, God calls something ancient. That's got to be pretty old, you know, if God uses the word ancient for him. And so uh, there was a history to the creation before we were introduced into it. Yet we have a destiny, and that destiny put us on a uh, crash course with this adversary who coveted our place, it seems. He wanted to uh, be somebody, and he saw Adam as competition, so he decided to take us out by simply making a suggestion, uh, by simply inviting us to break the laws that would condemn us to death so that he could stand in the heavenly court and say, I just made a suggestion. You wanted this man in uh, this house of clay in whom you breathed your spirit to become the judge over the angels, yet I just made a simple suggestion and he took it. And so is he, does he really deserve to become this, uh, this great, great Adam? Um, and this started our story, and in the sight of all of creation, God's response, of course God could have killed us and started all over again, that's not a big deal for him. But he decided uh, God's response was to show tremendous love. And I think that there are many, many conscious, sentient beings watching this story. Because, you know, I think Paul says in Romans that the whole creation um, awaits, you know, an expectation of the revelation of the sons of God uh, uh, from this planet. And so we have, have a lot of eyes on us. And so God then responds to this attack by showing tremendous love and all of creation is witnessing the love of God and all of creation is perhaps learning something about their God that he is above all love and so he turns this story around and he makes what could have been a tragedy into a great victory and into a great exposition of love 
And so we have this distance from God right now because of what happened in history. We know of him, but yet he's behind a veil. We know of our own immortality. Intuitively, we understand our soul is going to is eternal, yet we uh, have to face the inevitability of death. We are capable of much great good and wonderful things, yet we are aware of the great evil that sits in us. And so this is because of what happened in, in, in our ancient history, this condition we find ourselves in. And so God has sent a redeemer to restore and to heal and to reestablish our souls, our minds, our hearts, to give us a new body that it doesn't have this corruption that uh, Br- Brother Casper was talking about of, of, the, of the sons of God and, and, the, and, the, and the way they corrupted the human race. And also uh, to restore our place in the cosmic order. Once again, we will stand uh, at the foot of God and we will serve uh, as the royal priesthood um, uh, in, in the heavenly Jerusalem so that we have a destiny. And it's really fantastic to understand that the word of God is so rich that it has explain uh, the true nature of reality to us. It's not a religion. And God is real. His spirit is real. His angels are real. We are real. This planet is real. History is real. Our story has been a supernatural story from the beginning. And once we understand that, it becomes more palatable to, 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 to see what's going on today, whether it's the, uh, uh, you know, the fallen angels and the knowledge they're giving us, whether it's the uh, seed uh, that they're putting into the human world with, with uh, you know, the creation of hybrids that has been a constant in human history. Um, all of this stuff makes more sense once we remember who we are and the story in which we find ourselves in, which has been a supernatural story from the beginning, which has been a story that has involved God and angels from the beginning, because we are of the world of God and angels. Um, they, I don't like this word because it's not biblical. It's from you know the Jewish mysticism of Kabbalah, but just you know as as a way of shaking around our thinking, I like it. Uh, it they say that Earth is one of the celestial worlds. Now, that's not a biblical concept, but I like the fact that it kind of pulls us out of the secular thinking and says there's something special about this planet. There's right, something right. spiritual about what is happening on the stage uh, of, of the history of this planet. And, and so we have to really kind of shake our minds. You know, you look at the secular movement. Um, when did it start? Well, the, there is the two Babylons of Hisip that talks about the, this uh, idea that was hatched by, you know, this very top secret society called the Illuminati out of Bavaria. And that led to, you know, the rise of Bolshevism and communism and the rise of socialism and this whole idea of a secular uh, paradigm that begins to cover the Western world and even, you know, all of Europe, all the way to Moscow. And it kind of gives us a new way of understanding ourselves and the world in which we find uh, ourselves, which contradicts and erases the history that God had informed us of. We're no longer sons and daughters of the one who was made in the image of God, but we are, you know, evolved uh, apes. Uh, we, we are no longer in a cosmic tale, uh, uh, which allows, you know, the, the fallen angels to reinvent themselves as modern day aliens, like they've just arrived. You know, not uh, forget the fact that they've been here all this time. Like we're talking about Persia, well, in Ezekiel, in Daniel chapter 10, an angel comes to speak uh, to Daniel, but it says that the prince of Persia withstood him for 21 days. One day, that's right. So there's an angel coming, and there's a power behind the Persian Empire that is angelic. And this it, it guy is able to put up a fight with this angel from heaven. He's got a call for backup, and Michael, he calls for Michael, the prince of Israel, to come. And then he says, after I fought the prince of Persia, I have to go and fight the prince of Greece. And so when I was um, in Iran in the year 2000, in December of 2000, we were driving down late at night, past midnight in the, in the desert with my dad and his wife. Uh, she was driving. He was sitting in the back seat and I was sitting in the front seat. And we had a massive UFO sighting, which started really kick-started my research uh, and led to the documentary UFOs, Angels, and Gods. And this thing was coming down. Eventually, it was perpendicular to the window. And I thought what I saw in the darkness of the desert night was a tube, a large cylinder that came out of the earth. And this thing went on top of it, and it went into the ground. 
and it went into the ground. It had an angle of descent. It was slowly coming down, and then it went on top of this thing, went to the ground. And you think, well, is this really new? But the Bible talks about the Prince of Persia. How long have these guys actually been in this land? Uh, well, it seems that they were here already at the time of Daniel, and they're here today. And so you see there's kind of um, uh, a larger timeline that we have to take into consideration to understand what is happening today in the world and, yeah. and why is all this crazy stuff coming together. Because this is a culmination of a tale that began in the Garden of Eden. It is a culmination of a tale that has always involved the angelic world, a larger reality, God, because of who we are and who we have been from the beginning. And the enemy has tried to reinvent our identity. I mean, that's what the Nazis were doing to the Jews, right? They're telling them, your identity is not true. You know, we're going to recreate your identity. We're going to, you're not who, who, you're nobody, basically. And so this has always been, you know, part of the strategy is to say, you're not really who the, who the word of God says you are. And uh, we're going to reinvent reality for you. But the word of God has thrived. I know heaven and earth will pass away, but more word will not. The word of God has been translated, even recently was translated into the language of the Inuit people of, uh, the, uh, of Canada. Um, and, and it was translated into Inuktitut. And so really it has traveled the world and has been kept for all generations, for all nations to consider uh, and be instructed concerning the true nature of reality. And that is what we need to understand what's happening in the world. Um, and that's really my belief. And it's a wonderful thing. It's just very rich, very nourishing uh, and fascinating. Um, so Ezekiel 38, you know, we were ta you mentioned that, Pastor Bren, about uh, the prophecy about Iran. It, what's interesting about that chapter is where it is placed in the scroll. So if you kind of go back to chapter, you know, 36, it talks about, it's a prophecy about this land, this piece of land, and um, that God had carved out. Um, and, you know, we were talking about powers and principalities. Well, if you go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32, verse 8 and 9, it's the Song of Moses, um, and it talks about a division between uh, the nations and this chosen nation. Uh, uh, God, it, as part of his plan of redemption, of, of rescue, of undoing uh, the, what, what had happened in the Garden of Eden, he chooses a clan uh, to serve him, um, and he separates them from the nations. It says in 32, verse 8 and 9, and I like this translation that I find is you know, very correct. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And some translations will say that when God divided the nations, he, divide, uh, he fixed the borders according to the number of the sons of Israel. But the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, several hundred years before the time of Christ, which is quoted by the Lord and quoted by Paul and circulated in the early church, attached to the letters of, of Paul, um, says the sons of God that the nations, you know, were divided and their boundaries were set and the num uh, according to the number of the sons of God. And so does the most ancient Hebrew script we have of this passage, which, which yeah. was found in the Dead Sea Caves. And so I like this translation, and it, it tells us that the, uh, there's a division. On one hand, there's Israel, and God is the spiritual force behind Jacob. He will place his temple there. He will speak his uh, word his oracles uh, will be passed down by the prophets of Israel, by the scribes of Israel, and eventually he manifests himself. Um, he comes down into the world, into the line of King David, and fulfills the atonement laws uh, of, of the Torah, you know, of the, of the writings of Moses. So as part of this, there is a division uh, when it comes to land. So what we are told is that every nation has received an inheritance 
has been given borders by God. Um, and, and there are many other passages that we can look at uh, that, that establish this, and there's lots of stuff from Mesopotamian history, uh, like there, you know, there were these border stones that you would place to indicate where was the border of your land, and there was always the sign of the gods above it, you know, who protected you. Um, we even see that in the passage in, in Genesis, I think it's in 15, where God gives uh, Abraham a particular piece of land and declares himself over it and uh, explains where the borders of this land will be. So Israel was given a piece of land, but so did other nations also receive their own land, and they had a spiritual force behind them as well, the sons of God, which is an idiom for the fallen angels. Uh, That's right. Fallen angel doesn't exist in the Bible. They're called the sons of God or the gods of the nations, and they are the spiritual forces behind the nations. And this is true all the time. Uh, uh, this is true until the time of the Lord Jesus when he uh, uh, rises uh, to the Father and sends the Holy Spirit to the earth, starting with Cornelius in the city of Caesarea, which was the only Roman city in the Holy Land, the only, only city that was not of the Holy Land. He takes a Roman centurion and, and there in Caesarea begins uh, the freeing of the nations from bondage to the sons of God, the way that the children of Israel were freed by the Passover lamb uh, from Egypt and from the gods of Egypt. Now the Passover lamb will free the Greeks and the Romans, the Persians and the Mesopotamians, the Indians and the Chinese from the same spiritual forces uh, that, that the children of Israel were, were, kept, were kept captive to uh, in, in the days of Egypt. And the Passover, the Passover lamb goes out. The young Matthew tells us, you know, it was in the days of Noah, we were there. We've got numerous yeah. reports of people claiming that aliens are living among us, people claiming they've been abducted. I've ministered to several of them over the years. Um, it's a team of stem cell researchers at Rockefeller Center, uh, Rockefeller University, rather, uh, in New York, that are seemingly done the impossible, where they've um, had combined a... Um, human cells with an embryo of a chicken. I mean, this crazy stuff is going on around us. We've got bioprinting today. You know, people just printing hearts and lungs and all the rest of it. So we are there. Pastor Brown, I think we're about out of time. And there's probably some people watching this going, whoa, wait, you know, this is real. This is really happening. They need to make the peace with the Lord Jesus. Would you be so kind is to, to pray right now? Absolutely. I'd be honored. Thank you, brother. Father, we just want to come to you right now, Lord, and we want to say thank you for the opportunity tonight to share a moment together, Lord, uh, as brothers in Christ, Lord, to hopefully be able to uh, be the salt and the light that you have called us to be, Lord, to to shed some light into a dark world. Uh, Father, I thank you that that you have not uh, that you have not left anything to 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 chance. That everything is is planned and purposed, Lord. Uh, I thank you for your word, which when we study, when we diligently seek you, that you reveal to us, Father. Father. And so, Lord, I pray for the one right now that may be listening that that something that's been said here tonight has gotten their attention. And for the very first time, uh, they may have come to grips with the fact that they were created with a plan and a purpose by a creator. And Father, we pray for that one right now, Lord, that they would hit their knees, that they would cry out to you, Lord, that they would seek you with all of their heart, that they would have a repentant heart, Lord, that they would begin to turn away from their sin, to cry out to you, to call on you on the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, that they would call on you as their Savior, like, and, and that they would they would just feel your spirit even in this moment, Father. Yes, Lord, for one that for one that may just be full of confusion uh, in in their life, Lord, because of the very things that we've talked about tonight, uh, I just pray for clarity of their thinking, Lord. Your word says you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of soundness of mind. So, Father, we pray for soundness of mind, Lord, uh, to enter into your people tonight, Lord, that we would be able to see clearly the times that we live in, that we would be able to see clearly uh, the message of your word for our time and our day. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And hallelujah. And if you prayed along with Pastor Brandon, let somebody know. You can contact us here at the upperroomfellowship.org and redeemministries.org and we'll do everything we can to, to help you along on the journey.
And as Ali's a wealth of knowledge, not to worry, he'll be back to share some more. And we'll see everybody here, there, and the air. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to another adventure with Spiritual Encounters. We are here to help represent God's work, not ours. Besides the insightful biblical teachings shared by our host, Pastor Casper, we are also very blessed to be able to bring you outstanding interviews with some of the most sought after deep thinkers and voices in Christendom today, helping to make a difference in this world for Christ's sake. We want to keep it that way, to be truly effective in internal matters, truly demands on prayer and being led of the Holy Spirit. 
If you, like us, long to see the Lord Jesus, Joshua, glorified here through spiritual encounters, we invite you to join the prayer team. There is nothing more exciting than participating in intercessory prayer with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are a totally faith-based ministry, and so please give and support spiritual encounters as you are led. Truly, Grace and Radio have a lot in common. Grace is free to us, but cost Christ an untold price. We may never fully understand this side of heaven. Radio is also free, too. It costs nothing to turn on your dial or stream audio, but it costs us a lot to stay on the air. Spiritual Encounters is almost entirely listener-supported, a privilege, but rare things in these days of big church radio corporations. We've carefully trimmed our budgets to all but wartime essentials, but operating costs are a fact of life. If you've been blessed through our programme, here are some ways you can give back as the Holy Spirit leads. Consider becoming an underwriter by contacting us or simply go to the upper room, fellowship.org and scroll down on the main page to donate. Production of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries. Visit us at theupperroomfellowship.org. This program is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The intro and outro music is performed by Casper McLeod from his album Communion, available at theupperroomfellowship.org. In my face, since I learned to pray. I got a new 